Anybody here that's, that's interested in that, speak to Ron. We have any uh, birthdays or anniversaries? Prayer requests. Karen Paint Jeffers and her family. She asked for prayers. Me and my family on prayer requests. I guess y'all remember me uh, going through uh, some things of work. I asked for. Uh, a change at work and uh, hopefully it'll be better to kind of step down I'm like a safety man right now on the ground we'll be going to the surface of the brick hatch sort of all the way from the beginning but sometimes you gotta start over and I think it's what I need to do so just ask y'all pray <coughs> during this transition. Continue to remember Junior and Raymond. He said they were had to be quarantined for five days, and then they have to wear a mask for five days. But they were better today. They don't forget with us. Right? Yeah, he said they were a lot better today, just coughing so bad. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of being in your house this evening. Lord, we bring the uh, prayer request up to you, Lord, that you'll undertake in every situation, Lord Jesus. God, we thank you for all your blessings, for your protection that we a lot of times don't even know about, Lord. We just thank you for always being there and taking care of us and being with Ronnie, Lord, as he brings forth the message tonight. We're taking our hearts and Lord, help us to be a better light shining out for you tomorrow than we were than we were today. And we just want to say thank you. We love you with all for all that you do for us. Amen. One thirteen in the red book.
been in there, and anytime we need help, he's always there for us. When we praise him, he's always listening. And you know, I just thank him for always being there. Amen. He'll be back in church. Always. Oh, yeah, so yeah, we just have it, you can tell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anybody got any songs? Anybody else? get saved, 
And then just live any old way I want to. Can we do that? No, we can't. And I know that most people that believe that we cannot ever lose our salvation don't live that way. They, they, they really don't. But most of them live a real good Christian life. Actually, but what I'm saying, it, it, it leaves room for that kind of an interpretation if we're not careful. And uh, the Bible teaches us that our salvation is sure. How many believes it is? Amen. <laughs> our salvation is sure. Jesus, Jesus gave us salvation. And Jesus did not slap on anything. Amen. He gave it total, full, and complete. And Paul would also teach us in another scripture that we are sealed by the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. The day of redemption referring to the day that the Lord calls us out and takes us home. And we are sealed by that Spirit until the day of redemption. But church, we've got to do our part. We've got to do our part. There's guidelines to live a Christian life. And we have to go by the guidelines. When we do our communion service, Paul gives us a, a beautiful scripture there. And it's not only there, it's in some other places too. It's in, it's in the book of Romans, I think, chapter 16. And, and, and what I'm referring to is Paul would say, as we're doing our communion service, let a man examine himself. And I think that's what we need to do on a daily basis. Examine our own self. Examine our own life. Now, you know, uh, Joshua, uh, the leader after Moses of the children of Israel, Joshua had this all figured out, I believe. I don't know if he was aware of it or not when he spoke these words. But he spoke to the, uh, the leaders of, of Israel, the leaders of all the tribes. He gathered them all together. Moses, <coughs> excuse me, had passed away. He was gone, and Joshua had taken command, and he gathered all of the leaders of the tribes of Israel together for a meeting, and what he said to them was, he said, you choose this day whom you're going to serve. He said, but for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. And you know, that's what we need to do every day. Well, actually, we do do it every day. Choose this day. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to serve? You know, there's, there, there's two out there that wants to lead us. God wants to be our leader. He wants to uh, uh, lead us into an eternal life of bliss and, and, and beauty and, and his kingdom for all eternity. Satan's also out there, and he wants to lead us. And where he will lead us is to hell and damnation to the lake of fire. Is what he'll do. He knows that's his destiny, and he wants to make it your destiny. And and you know he he he's our enemy. He's our adversary. The Bible says, and he's out as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's been doing this for a long, long time. You can read about him uh, back in the uh, in, in the book of Job, in the, uh, probably the second chapter, maybe maybe the first chapter. I don't know. But, uh, Job and, and, and some of his friends got together one day and they went up to the house of the Lord. They went to church, was what they done. They went to present themselves to the Lord. And uh, the Bible says right there that Satan went along with them. Don't you ever think Satan don't come to church? He probably comes to church more than a whole lot of Christians come to church. Satan comes to church and he went up, he went up with Job and uh, Job's friends and, and uh, God asked him right there. He says, where are you coming from, Satan? And does anybody remember what his answer was? From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. So he's out here, church. 
It's a force that you and I got to deal with. And he's been doing what he does for a long, long time. And he's the, the prince and the power of the air. He's the ruler of darkness. He's got some power. He's got some authority. But greater is he that's in me and you than he that's in the world. And that's what we got to always remember. Don't try to go up against him on your own. He tries to sneak into our life a little bit at a time. And believe me, he don't come all ugly and undesirable. We got him, the world's got him pictured as uh, with the horns and the tail and the pitchfork and everything. I'm going to tell you, Satan will appear as one of the best looking things you've ever seen in your life. I mean, who's going to be tempted by something that's ugly? Are you? Get back to my diet again. You know, my diet, spinach, and chocolate cake. Come on now. What, what's the decision there? <laughs> well, that's the way the devil is. That's how he comes in. But he's a destroyer. He has a threefold mission in this world. And that's to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. And it's all pointed at you. And he can take you over a little at a time if you're not careful. That's the way he comes in. You know, if we if we stand on the promises of God, he can't take us over. Right. But he'll try sneaking in a little at a time. A little of this, a little of that. You know, there ain't that much wrong with this. But there's really no harm in that. And if God is such a loving God, do you think he'll really send you to hell for this? You, you see what I'm saying? That's how he kind of creeps in. This is what Paul is warning us of. Because, according to Scripture, and this is what we have to base everything on. Not my thoughts or opinions. I got them. I try to tell you when it's my thought or opinion. But, but we, we base our, our decisions on God's Word, on what the Word tells us. We base our doctrine on what we learn from God's Word. And if we can't back it up and verify it in God's Word, then we need to work on it a little bit, don't we? Amen. This is how we, this is how we form our doctrines. And uh, we got some strange doctrines out there today. We really do. My oh, it flew away. It flew away. Yeah. <laughs> that tells us something, don't it? <laughs> it flew away. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And what, what, what he means here when he's talking about the heavenly calling. Uh, he's not necessarily talking about being called to preach or called to teach or called to sing or anything like that. We're called as the family of God, Christians, the born again. We're called into salvation. And that's, that's what he's referring to here. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider, and consider, think about this. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. When, when you think about the apostles, and, you know, Peter and Paul and James, the list just goes on and on. Did you ever think about Christ as an apostle? What is an apostle? He's a teacher. What was Christ? A teacher. Remember they called him many times rabbi? You know what the interpretation of a rabbi is? Teacher. <laughs> Jesus actually was the first apostle. And, 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 and Paul's bearing that out to us. Consider, I see it now, Christian, it's buzzing around my face. <laughs> Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. Okay, now, the apostle 
And the high priest of uh, our profession was appointed by him. Who was the him here? No, it's Christ that was appointed. Who was he appointed by? God, that's right. And speaking of Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him. Uh, Rodney, I was talking about the first hymn there. I see, where you, I see where you come from. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. Moses, now, uh, you know, if, 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 if we, and we have, we've studied about Moses and how he <coughs> uh, led the, uh, the children of Israel out of the Egyptian bondage and the miracles that were done by God through the hands of Moses and, and, and all these things and how, how he was persecuted but yet how faithful he was to his house and, and when Paul's talking right here and he's talking about the, the house of Moses very often just like I was talking about Joshua he said as for me and my house will serve the Lord he's speaking of his family Moses here is not speaking of his family. Or Paul's not speaking about Moses of his family. He's talking about the whole family of God. The whole family of the Hebrews. That's who Moses, Moses was faithful to God, but that means that he was faithful to the Hebrews in bringing them out of the Egyptian bondage. And that's what it's talking about here. So uh, try, try to keep that separated and don't get it, uh, get it confused with uh, just Moses family. He was uh, faithful in all his house. Well, this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Do you understand what man is talking about? This man was uh, counted worthy of more glory than Moses? Jesus He's talking about Christ, yeah. He's talking about Jesus there. Inasmuch as he who had Build of the house. Remember, the house that we're talking about here is at, basically at the point of Moses, it was the Hebrews. But today we look at it as all the children of God that we've been adopted in. Always remember that. Romans chapter 8, the spirit of adoption. We've been adopted in. So we would be counted here. So uh, uh, let me find the spot. In as much as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. So Moses was counted, uh, uh, Jesus was counted more worthy than Moses because he had a much broader territory. And plus he was the son of God. And he was a high priest. And uh, he was uh, uh, an, uh, the original apostle. He's our Savior. So for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. Now we'll kind of compare this to a structural house. Somebody goes out and, and, and builds a house, and we'll, we'll look at it and say, boy, that's a nice house. Somebody done a good job. Who built that house? And then somebody will say, so-and-so built it. So the, the builder of the house gets more praise and honor than the house itself. The same is true here. Jesus, the house that you and I belong to, or let me say the family that you and I belong to, which is the family of God, is built by Christ himself. And Christ has more honor and more glory than the house. The house being us that he's talking about here. So who deserves the most glory? Christ. Christ. Because without him, there would be no house. Why? He's the builder of the house. That's what Paul's trying to, to bring out and uh, stress to us. I may be confusing it a little bit. I hope not. For every house is built by some man. <clears throat> now again, here he's referring to a structural house. 
But he that built all things is God. God built, built all things. Uh, people, people say, I've done this and I've done that. And we as Christians with our, our, our faith and our witness and our testimony and, and, you know, boy, we're strong on our faith. And they'll say, I've done this and I've done that, you know. And we'll be the first to jump up and say, God done that. And they'll say, he did not. I've done it myself. I built this house with my own sweat and tears and blood and, and everything else. Who, who gave you the strength to do it? Where did that come from? Who gave you the knowledge to do it? You know, uh, uh, can't everybody just jump up and build a house. You got to know how to read a rule. You got to know how to cut a straight line. You uh, got to know how to add and subtract. You got to know a whole lot of things before you jump in to start building a house. If you're not prepared, did you ever see a house built by somebody that didn't know what they were doing? <laughs> well, you're, you're kind of right there, Rob. That you usually won't see it because it'll crumble before they ever get it done. Won't it? So, so you got to know what you're doing. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And we give God glory. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house, or in his service to all the family of God. That's what we mean to do. As a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. And what that pretty much means is we're still talking about him today. Uh, what he done, how he done it, and you know he was he was loyal and faithful. Moses Moses was raised a wealthy man. Remember how the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, sent out an order to destroy all the male children that were born of the Hebrews, and, and, and uh, of course the midwives wouldn't do it, and finally they rescued Moses and put him in the river, and Pharaoh's daughter drew him out and raised him in the house of the king. He was raised in a king's palace. And when he was about 40 years old, he realized his connection to the Hebrews, the slaves, who were dirt poor, had nothing. And he chose that over the house of royalty in Egypt. Then it cost him some things. Uh, in, in, in fact, he, he was uh, cast out for 40 years. But God chose him at the uh, right young age of 80 years old to go back to Egypt and bring his people out. He said, I heard their cry. Be sure, church, that God hears your cry. You know, these, these slaves cried out to God for a long time. But they were in that bondage for 400 years. But one day, God answered him. And he sent Moses back. Moses was faithful in his house. That was the people of God. He followed the instruction that God gave him, sent him to do. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we? This clears up any doubt. If, if, if I got you confused, then I may well have, okay? This is, this is who the house is that we're finally coming down to talk about. It's me and you. Christ, as a son, son of God, we know that, over his own house, whose house are we? We're his house. If, uh-oh, here comes that word again. That big old two-letter word, if. Now look what this says. And understand it. If were his house, were part of the family of God, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Listen, church, that's all the way. If we don't hold it fast, holding it fast means holding it tight. Salvation 
is a precious thing. And if we're not real, real careful, we can let it slip. And that's what the devil wants. And he makes it so easy for us to let it slip. As I said, he creeps in a little at a time. <coughs> when this little thing's all right, that little thing's all right, it'll be okay. God ain't going to hold that against you. Listen, listen. God don't change the rules for you. <laughs> he don't change them for me. Sometimes, being honest, Sometimes we wish he would. But it's written. You can't change what's written. What are you going to do? Erase a verse? A chapter? A line? A word? Go back to the very last of the book and see what happens if you do. I'll tell you what happens if you do. If you add to this word, the prophecy of this book. If you add to it, the plagues of the book will be added to you. That's if you add to it. If you take away from them, your part in the kingdom of heaven will be taken from you. Read Revelation chapter 22. Your part of the kingdom of heaven. So don't take away from the word of God and don't add to the word of God. Take it as it is. If something needs adjustment, my friend, it's me and you that needs to be adjusted. Look at that mirror, the spiritual mirror. Do the self-examination Paul talked about. You see, what, you see what the word is saying right here. We'll read it again. But Christ has a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. Matthew <coughs> chapter 24, uh, the disciples are questioning Jesus. They, uh, they, they're at the temple, and... and, and, and uh, the disciples are showing Jesus all of the fancy works of the temple. It was Solomon's temple. And I don't know how many of us here have done a study on that. And boy, was it ever more an elaborate structure. It really and truly was. And, and uh, uh, well, I, I'm wrong. This temple wasn't uh, Solomon's. It was uh, Zerubbabel's. This was after... Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed Solomon's temple. But it was still an elaborate structure. And they were talking with Jesus, the disciples, and showing him all of the stones. He said, uh, uh, look at the fancy stonework and the precious stones uh, that, that we, we have here for God's house. And, you know, this is where their uh, thoughts were. This is where their heart was. It was wrapped around the, the glory of the building instead of God. And Jesus said to him, he said, I'll tell you, the day will come that there won't be one stone left here upon another. And then they begin to ask him, well, when's these things going to be? And he starts giving them the signs to look for here in Matthew chapter 24. He's giving them the signs to look for. He talks about the earthquakes in the, uh, the various places. He talks about the wars and the rumors of war. Man, we ain't living in the heart of that. I don't know. I don't know what it is. And he talks about the, uh, the, the, the the family unit. The family unit being destroyed. It'll be uh, children against their parents and parents against their children. And look today. Look today. I don't think, I think you'd be hard put in America to find a solid family unit today. That's the work of the devil. Yes. You know, he, he, he knows if he can destroy that family unit, and a lot of it he has, he's got his foot in that door. We see it happen. When we get on down to
to about verse 13 there. And Jesus says something dynamic to the disciples as he's talking about all this. He says, to him that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Church, you know what that means? That means if we fall away from the salvation that God has given us, we're a lost creature and we're on our way to the lake of fire. Now a lot of people don't want to hear that. Many out there probably won't agree with that. The church is Bible. It's Bible. Those who endure to the end are the ones who will be saved. Ain't that what Paul just said here uh, about Christ? But, as, but Christ as a son over his own house, which is us, whose house are we, if we hold facts, if we hold it, there's an if there, the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, hope for what? Eternal life. Firm, hold it firm until the end. We got to go all the way through this thing. Well, I can't live a perfect life all my life. No, you can't. And you ain't going to. And I ain't going to. And ain't none of God's children going to. And that's exactly why Jesus is where he's at, doing what he's doing. He's at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and me. And church, I need him right there. Amen. And so do you. Listen to this. Listen to what Peter said. I, I, I refer to this a whole lot. Uh, but I'm going to refer to it again. It's in 2 Peter chapter 2, down to verse 19, if you want to turn there. And it says, Peter says here, while they, and the they that he's talking about right here in this verse, are the false teachers. Okay, Peter uh, talked a whole lot about false teachers, false prophets, and how they're coming. He says, while they promised them, which would be us, liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. In other words, we're a bondman to our own lifestyle, whether it's good or whether it's bad. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, you know what that means right there in, the, in, in, in that part of the words? That means that you've been saved. You've accepted Jesus as your Savior, and now you're saved by His shed blood. Your sins are forgiven, and you're on your way to heaven. Now, if uh, once they've escaped the pollutions of the world, that sin, through the knowledge of Jesus, they are again entangled therein, entangled in the, uh, the pollutions of the world, or entangled in the sin. You know, we all get tangled up sin sometimes. And we do. Uh, road rage is a perfect example, and I won't say more about it. But it is a perfect example. We get entangled sometimes in the sin. <laughs> but it goes on here and says, and overcome. Overcome. Now to be overcome by something, which in this case would be sin, that means that is what rules your life. If you're overcome by sin, sin will rule your life. Getting tangled in sin is one thing. But being overcome by that is a whole different thing. So when we find ourselves entangled in sin, repent. God will let you start over. Ain't that, ain't that a good thing? People, people, you know, they, they, they might uh, give you a second chance. They might give you a third chance. And if they like you a whole lot, you might squeeze a fourth chance out of it. But with God, it's different, ain't it? With God, it's different. If we repent with a sincere heart, we can start all over. 
Amen. Well, how many times can we do that? Everybody picks the number Jesus talked about, about forgiving people. That number is just to say it's limitless. Because there's, there's, there's some that would probably offend you more than the number Jesus gave us. <laughs> but what he's meaning, it's limitless. God's love toward us is limitless. His mercy is limitless. Okay, so if they are uh, 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 again entangled therein and overcome, listen to this, the latter end or the last state of it is worse with them than the beginning. In other words, if you get saved and you go back to the Lord, it's better for you if you never got saved to start with. You get what he's saying there? Listen, listen to this next verse. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It would be better if they had never been saved to start with and go out of this world lost. What's that tell us? What does that tell us? It tells us that there are degrees of punishment. And that's verified in another scripture. Because Jesus himself said that the hypocrites, the hypocrites would receive a greater damnation. Let's be what we are. Don't try to be something we're not. Let's be what we are and let Jesus work for that. Amen. Boy, he can do it, can he can do it. Now, <coughs> listen to this. Hope you've had yourself. But it has happened unto them, according to the true power, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. Ain't that nasty? That's just downright disgusting, ain't it? That's how God is summoned up the people that backslide. And the south that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That would be the mud. It says that's a true proverb. You can find it in Proverbs 26 and 11. Now we get back to chapter 3 of Hebrews. So what Paul says from here. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, the prov provocation comes from the word provoke, provoke. And in the, the day of, of temptation, it's, it's the wandering, the 40 year wandering in the wilderness of the children of Israel when they wouldn't go into the promised land as instructed by God because they feared the enemies because the enemy looked big and they looked small. So they wanted to go back to Egypt. And uh, God, God told them uh, for that they would not enter into his rest. In other words, into the promised land. So they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness to all of that generation had died off because God wouldn't allow them to go into his promised land after what they had done. They wanted to go back to Egypt. So their hearts were hardened is what it's talking about. So Paul's Tell us here, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, uh, and that means that they provoke the Lord to anger in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, challenged him, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart, in their heart. We're going, to, we're going to mess up in this place. We really are. But it's our heart that God's looking on. They err in their 
their heart because they wouldn't change their heart and believe that God was going to take care of them. And they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed. Now listen, Paul's, Paul's talking to us here. Take heed. Take this warning. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You know, and, and to be honest, sometimes we can all get to that point. The world gets so evil and uh, uh, the, we see the wicked prosper. Same, same thing David was saying, Lord, why does the wicked prosper and the heathen rage? And we're saying the same thing today. And sometimes we get to where we feel like just throwing our hands up and quitting. Don't do that. Don't let that overcome you. Paul's telling us here, take heed. Brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Don't do it, church. Don't let it happen. But exhort one another daily. Urge one another daily. If you see your brother down and discouraged, urge him, encourage him a little bit. Uh, help him, pick him up. Tell him he don't, he don't, and you know, sometimes people say, I'm just going to quit church. No, don't, you don't want to do that. If you don't like this church, find you another one. But don't quit church. Don't quit God. Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. And if you quit, you ain't going. It's just that simple, ain't it? For we are made partakers. Now, wait a minute, I left some out. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. While it's called today. You know, there's, there's really no such thing as tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. And we don't know if tomorrow's coming. So exhort one another. Or that's to urge and encourage while it's called today. Okay? Let's encourage one another. Y'all the best ones ever. Amen. While it's today. Yes, Be that way tomorrow too. <laughs> <laughs> Lest any of you be hardened and it can happen through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. And that's just simply saying, some hardened their hearts and some didn't. Some changed their hearts and they didn't see the promise of it. But some did, didn't they? But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Yes, they did. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. What it, what it was, they didn't believe God would take care of them. Now, there was a, a, a part, at, and I think you'll find this in, in uh, the book of Numbers. I want to say chapter 14, but it probably starts along about chapter 12, and it covers about three chapters. But, but God told Moses, to uh, uh, call the heads of the tribes and pick out one from each tribe and send them over. And they were on, right on the edge of the promised land and send them over into the promised land. And scope it out and see if it's a good man. See what's up there. See what's going on. So they did. And uh, Ironically, they were gone 40 days. They ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So. But while they were over there in the promised land, they, boy, they, they found it was a, a land indeed that flows with milk and honey. It was a great land. It was a big land and, and everything. And you remember they, they brought the grapes back. But, uh, the grapes were so big that uh, a cluster of them had to be carried on. Pole between two men. They had the pole on their shoulders carrying that cluster of grapes. It was a it was a great land. But also they found giants in that land. And 
little big. Uh, and they said, uh, we, we look like grasshoppers beside them. They think we look like grasshoppers beside them. They're big. The, the enemy is big. And I always think of the talking giants. I always think about little old David going up against that giant. And what he done when he went out there, what he said, old Goliath come at him with all that stuff he had. But when David went out there, he said, you come with me with your armor and your spear and your, uh, I don't know, all of this and all of that. He said, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. The battle is not mine, but it's God's. And these people, would not believe that God could take care of their enemy. They didn't believe it. And that's where their sin come in. And that's why they were not allowed to enter in to the promised land. But what was, what was ironic? What was ironic? Some of them, the next day, they start hollering it'd be better off back in Egypt. We're going to go back to Egypt. Uh, you know, at least we wasn't in no danger. <coughs> And, and uh, uh, Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and uh, began to intercede for the, for the people and all that. Well, the next day, some of these people that were going to go back to Egypt had changed their mind. And they said, okay, Moses, we're ready now. We're going to go up to the promised, uh, go into the promised land. You come go with us. Moses said, I ain't going. I ain't going with you because I'll tell you what, God ain't going to go with you. If you go, you're on your own, and if you go, you're going to be destroyed. But we're going to go now. It's too late. They went. Sure enough, some of them went. And all them Jebusites and Hittites and Hivites and uh, I don't know how many ice there was. There was a bunch of them. But boy, I'll tell you what. They put the clients on. Mm -hmm. And none of them come back. None of them come back. You've got to move when God says move. That's why Paul would later teach us that now is the day of salvation. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You don't have that promise at all. You don't have a promise of the next minute. So we see that they did not enter in. Couldn't enter into God's rest. But that's, that's what he's called the promised land. God's rest. Do you want to enter in to God's promised land? Amen. Ain't we shooting for a promised land? Amen. Amen. Didn't God make us a promise that if we serve him, that if we're faithful, we'll enter in to his kingdom, to his glory, to his riches? Church, we're heading for that promised land. But unbelief won't get you that. Sin won't get you that. Let me say, unrepentant sin. Okay? It won't get you that. We got to. Uh, I like what Martin Luther King said. We may have a little different thought on it, but Martin Luther King, in one of his speeches, said, Keep your eyes on the prize. And Paul talked about his prize, the prize of the high calling of God. Church, we're on our way to heaven. Let's get this thing right, okay? Let's get it right. Let's stay true on an everyday basis. Amen? Amen. Just stand. Altar's open, but you want to come up and pray for a little bit before we leave. You feel free. Let's just take a minute or two and worship the Lord before we go home. <coughs>
appreciate you coming out and being with us. I hope the Lord touched you in some way. Remember our announcements. Next Sunday's the following day then. We look forward to that. Oh, my Lord. Pop-up. I love pop-up. That's the best stuff you can get. <laughs> In all hearts and minds.